Welcome to Real Talk, real estate discussions with Andrew Kirsch. In each episode, Andrew interviews industry leaders. We'll hear their real-time opinions on today's market, their background and unique career highlights and guidance for newcomers to the industry. You can find this show at www.sklarkirsch.com and on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts and more. Now here's the host of Real Talk, Andrew Kirsch. Hello, I'm Andrew Kirsch and I'm host of the Real Talk podcast. Each week, I'm going to interview a leader in the real estate industry. We will be speaking with developers, operators, capital providers, brokers across all asset classes within real estate. Now, when I'm not hosting the Real Talk, I do have a day job. I'm co-founding partner of Sklar Kirsch, a law firm based in Los Angeles, where we have about 60 to 65 employees. I like to say we are a firm of former big law firm refugees. We provide the same type of institutional quality of legal services that you'd expect to find at those large firms, but in a much more boutique, cost-effective, relationship-oriented setting. I run the real estate group, consists of about 20 professionals. And in 2021, we closed approximately 200 transactions, which amounted to almost $7 billion in aggregate deal volume across 15 states. Now, today, as we record this podcast in October, we're living through some interesting times. During the COVID period, uh, 2020, things were shut down. But only 12 months later, in the middle of 2021, it was some of the most robust times in our real estate industry. Now, just fast forward another 12 months, which is where we sit today, and the market has almost basically come down to a grinding halt. And that's due to one reason, interest rates. The Federal Reserve has increased interest rates significantly. That has led to a slower market. There's just simply no price discovery. Buyers and sellers have not come together on the price of real estate. Sellers still remember just a few short months ago uh, what their real estate was worth. And buyers are thinking if they don't buy today, they can just wait a few months and buy that same real estate for a lot cheaper. Now, this isn't exactly like the depths of COVID in 2020. There are some transactions that are being done, but it's nothing like it was in 2021 or even the first quarter of 2022. The deals that we are seeing are longer development deals where uh, developers hope to come online not until 2024 or 2025. Now for our first show, we're really excited. We have a great conversation with Keith Wasserman, who's the founder of Gelt, which owns approximately $2 billion of multifamily real estate across the Western United States. Now I have known Keith for over 10 years, and you're gonna enjoy hearing his story from his very first purchase of a four unit apartment building in Bakersfield, California, to now where he routinely buys high eight to even nine figure price transactions. With his most recent acquisition here in the San Fernando Valley, in which he raised $39 million of syndicated equity to purchase a nine figure deal. Let's listen to that discussion with Keith. All right, well, thank you for joining me on our inaugural episode of Real Talk. Keith Wasserman, founder of Gelt. It's a real honor and privilege to have you on my first show of Real Talk. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This this is only going to go up in value, man, from, from this one on. you know, I, uh, I feel honored. Well, uh, it is my honor and uh, to speak to someone with uh, almost as many Twitter and Instagram followers as Kim Kardashian. This is... Uh, <laughs> Quite, quite the, uh, quite the experience for me. So, Keith, first and foremost, where does this podcast find you? Um, yeah, we just moved into our new office in Brentwood. Uh, I'm a case study of what's going on in office space. We had 5,000 square feet, uh, that, you know, pre-COVID, where everyone was going to work every day, and now there's only maybe two or three of us in the office now. We're down to like 1,500 square feet, so uh, we're definitely downsizing. But uh, the location's uh, very close to home in, a, in an upgraded uh, building and upgraded area, so. Uh, that's where I'm at in Brentwood, Cal- Brentwood in the LA area. 
Yep. Well, I've always said that the key to mastering living in Los Angeles is to live and work either on the same side of the 405. So the fact that I know you live in the Palisades, you now work in Brentwood, you don't have to cross what I call the Berlin Wall of the 405 freeway. I do cross that wall and in, in, in Century City. Um, I do want to get into, you know, the the amazing uh, uptick uh, of of Gelt since you started it in 2008. How you started with just a fourplex in Bakersfield to now it's almost two billion dollars under management. I may be even off on those numbers, and I know that you recently acquired um, about a 150 unit building in uh, in the valley and this market that we're in right now uh, as of taping it at the end of september of 2022 is is definitely an interesting time so uh i do want to get into your whole background and 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 gel but talk to me about why you purchased this uh recent building uh in the valley and what your overall sentiment is uh on the real estate market as a whole yeah um so if you've been tracking our track record, you, you've been seeing we you know, started locally and you know, not too local, two hours north of LA, bit in Bakersfield, and then quickly went out of state. We were buying in Phoenix in 2010 through 15. And then we moved into other Southwest like Denver, Salt Lake City, Portland, Seattle. Over the last three years though, we've been buying a lot in Southern California. Um, Studio City is I think the premier best part of the San Fernando Valley. Um, you have entry level housing starting at two and a half to $3 million. And um, it's just very supply constrained. There's only been three buildings built over the last 25 years that are 100 units and up in that area. And I think this is just a window of time where a lot of people are fearful about buying in Southern California and California in general. And um, cap rates have actually inverted. They're higher here uh, than in markets like Phoenix and Vegas, which is quickly shifting uh, as interest rates have been rising. I think it's already where those markets are going to be back to where they normally are at, at higher levels than the lower cap rates in the stable markets like Southern California. So um, yeah, this, this building was, uh, during a normal time, it would be tough to buy. We bought it from a, a publicly traded REIT, Avalon Bay. We have never transacted with them before. Um, they took a chance on us. We per, you know, performed smoothly and beautifully, even though the interest rates were rising dramatically while we were in contract. But um, yeah, we, we uh, I, I, I even learned this, that the publicly traded REITs start selling buildings when their stock price is down to generate cash to then buy back shares. So that's why you've, you've been sort of seeing them list a lot of buildings recently um, uh, on the coast where, where, where they have the most inventory. But yeah, we're really bullish, man, on, on where I, I'm from, the, the Valley. You have the Sportsman Lodge project that brought uh, Equinox and Irwan and top retailers and restaurants and, you know, all, all this tremendous amount of job growth over there. C CBS Studios was, was, was just acquired. Uh, by Hackman, they're going to probably, I'm not sure what their long-term plans on are with that site, but I think just, there's just been a lot of positive developments going on in that area and nightlife and people that want to live there. And it's just a great area. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, and then let's, let's talk about the market in general right now, as we see it. I mean, where, where we sit in, in, in my law firm, uh, I mean, even going back just a couple of years during the middle of COVID, right? July of 2020, every summer of 2020, let's call it, everyone thought, you know, uh, it was the end of the real estate market. Uh, the world was imploding. Uh, no one was doing deals. You fast forward 12, just 12 months, the summer of 2021, easily the busiest time of my 20 plus year career. Probably most real estate professionals could say that the market was on fire. Um, uh, cap rates were at all time low. Interest rates were, uh, as low as they could be. Then you fast forward another 12 months and you go to the summer of 2022, which I guess we're now the end of summer into the fall. And it's almost like we're back to where we were July of 2020. Uh, very few deals. Uh, rates have increased significantly. There's almost no price discovery. And uh, a lot of our clients, um, whether they're on the capital side or on the operator side, are on the sidelines. And yet you, um, you know, you come in and you buy uh, this 150 unit uh, building. So I guess, what are your thoughts with respect to the market and and how you're able to still transact in a market like today? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I've, I've always gone along the lines of, you know, when, when people are fearful, be greedy. When people are greedy, be fearful. And when you had all those transaction volume going on, 
that was a good time to be actually a seller. And but a lot of those people are on the other side buying, you know, when the when the prices were historic highs and with you know the rates were historic lows. And uh, but a, a lot of people had you know greed and and were buying with floating rate you know debt that um, you know when they were buying cap cap rates in the three or sub three and in markets that are very boom and bust. So when things are good and rents are growing, you know, then maybe you could get away with it. But when we had rate rates now have gone up tremendously, rents are are starting to plateau and flatline and decelerate. And it's like a, a recipe for disaster. Plus you have a lot of new inventory coming online in certain markets that, you know, where these borrow, borrowers are going in with 80 to 90% loan to cost kind of bridge financing. So um, I think uh, we, we, we evaluated the market. We, when the rates started rising, we sort of paused for a minute, see where things were at. And uh, this Studio City deal probably would have traded for around 85 million at the end of the fourth quarter when rates were low and we bought it for 76 million. So, you know, we're buying it at a much better basis. The cash on cash returns are starting lower because the interest rate is, rose so much, but I'd rather have a way better entry level point and a little less cash flow. Uh, and this is something we're going to hold, you know, long term. It's, it's, and it has tremendous value at all the units are original from 2009. We're going to spend, I think, uh, around 5 million upgrading the building interior and exterior and uh, still be dramatically lower than any of the new buildings uh, that have been built uh, in the area, which are very few anyway. Great. All right. Well, let's talk about Gelt and how you started it, when you started it. But even, you know what? Let's go even before that. Uh, tell our audience, tell my audience, um, you know, where did you grow up? And uh, give me a sense of, because I have a feeling it was a little different than my uh, uh, family dinner conversations where the uh, uh, conversations were centered more around sports and the Dodgers. And <laughs> uh, But you know, give me a sense of, what it was like growing up in the Wasserman household. Yeah. Um, so I came from a pretty entrepreneurial family, even though my dad practices law, just like you, he, I don't think he ever really loved doing it. He, he grew a pretty sizable practice. They became the biggest law firm in the San Fernando Valley. They had around 80 attorneys at one point, but he was always doing other business ventures and investing in real estate and doing some real estate development. And he never really like, I never was interested in practicing law. Um, I, I was always interested in starting some kind of business. Real estate sort of just fell in my lap when I saw the opportunity when buildings were selling for 25 cents on the dollar, basically, when we were, we were starting to buy buildings in 2009. And when uh, our first building we bought for like 150 grand and it previously sold for like 500 grand. So um, I, we always talked about business growing up. I mean, I did go to some Laker games with my father and stuff, but he was one to leave at the you know end of the third period, and I was always upset at him because he wanted to beat the traffic. And uh, he's a typical LA uh, sports fan. Yeah, exactly. But, but like we, um, you know, grew up talking about business, investing, the stock market, uh, real estate. You know, just um, things that you know were entrepreneurial. And I was entrepreneurial from the beginning. I had a different business. You know, ending of high school, beginning of college, I ran. Um, we, we became one of the largest uh, sellers of e on eBay. We sold around 200,000 items from 03 to 07 while I was in school um, attending USC. And I had a warehouse in the San Fernando Valley. I was going back and forth and um, just very entrepreneurial family. Yeah, didn't talk much about the sports and entertainment. And, you know, like I, I just uh, talked about business and work. And that's how my dad sort of bonded with his father. And it was a different business. It was the we call it the schmata business, the apparel business. He, he was working in his dad's factory and while he was getting his law degree and um, really enjoyed that. And I, I, I work with my dad to this day. He sort of slowed down his law practice and really helped grow our, our business. And then how, um, where'd you go to college? Uh, went to USC, stayed local. I'm sort of a boring, born and raised in LA, very rare breed. Um, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley in Woodland Hills, uh, the hard, hottest part of the San Fernando Valley, I'd say. And, um, you know, just lived in LA my whole life, but now I'm, I, uh, I'm on the West side, which is a, a big change, you know, 30 degrees cooler during the summer. And, um, our family's very happy here on the West side. So then what, uh, so when did you get in, into real estate and why real estate versus any other entrepreneurial businesses that you had dabbled in while, uh, I guess, a teenager or in college? Yeah, it, um, sort of fell in my lap. My cousin came to me with the opportunity to buy this four unit building in Bakersfield, California. And, I didn't, I didn't know where the hell Bakersfield was. I mean, literally, there's no reason for people in LA to go to Bakersfield. It's two, it's a, it's two and a half hours north of here, but it's a dynamic economy based on oil and agriculture. 
and um, it's affordable to live. You could live like a king out there, and you know, p- people people uh, live out there. And, and it was killed during the housing crisis. They sort of overbuilt these single family homes, and just during the housing bust, they they fell dramatically in value. And we were picking up these you know one to four unit kind of smaller residential properties for pennies on the dollar, and that's where we cut our teeth um, in, in in good old Bakersfield. We call it a uh, Baco dice on on good days or uh, Baker Tucky when we were frustrated with it a little bit. <laughs> okay, so that was the first one. And why don't you share as to you know how you capitalized it and uh, both on the equity side and the debt side and how old were you and um, you know yeah, how you was, all the details. Twenty four. Uh, Damien bought the first building with a FHA loan, uh, only two and a half percent down. Um, because he, he claimed he lived in one of the units. Um, he, he, his job supported that kind of travel. He didn't have to be, you know, in one place. So he, he, uh, put uh, five grand down, which he didn't even have. So he borrowed that from a friend and got a cash advance of $10,000 on his credit card. He moved his balance over to another credit card. They advanced him $10,000 and used that money to do the rehab on the project. And he really built the, bought the first one and showed me what he did. And I really liked that. And I, I put a lot of my savings, like. 35,000 into the next one. Um, it was like 150, $150,000 purchase ish. So, and I, I couldn't qualify for a loan because I was self-employed and he, he had still the W2 income and he qualified for the loan. And I mean, that's how we bought one together. And then we bought a third one with a family friend, put the down payment and we got on the loan. And, and, and then one of our early mentors showed us like we sold 49% of that entity that owned three of these little fourplexes. Um, they became performing assets, you know, more valuable as before when they were just boarded up, you know, pieces of junk. And, and um, we, you know, the value went up a lot. We, we used that money to buy another, I don't, I don't even know, five buildings or something. And, and then we just brought in like one family friend and the early deals, they used to put up all the money, but lend us our half to own half. So we would own half, they would own half, but we didn't have any money. So they would lend us our half at like 8% interest or something like this. And that's how we just like, cut our teeth with these little deals. And then we put our first syndication together. I read Principles of Real Estate Syndication by Sam Freshman, my friend and mentor. And I try to pick the brain of as many real estate professionals as I could. And I learned how to properly put the deal together with preferred returns and splits and fees and like to where the, t- the business is today. And we bought like a 78 unit building in Bakersfield in December of 09. Um, we put that's a big jump to go from a fourplex or yeah. you know, eight, 10 unit to 74. And you're what, 24, 25 years old. Um, how, how did you convince investors to invest with you to take, yeah. to take you seriously? Yeah, great question. So I'd say uh, we showed the track record of those 15 fourplexes. Um, we also brought on two partners. So it was just me, Damien, my cousin, and another young guy. We brought on two s- senior partners, or we call them the gray hair partners. Uh, one being my father, we made a partner, and the other one being Adrian Goldstein. So Adrian had experience um, working uh, for his father-in-law, owning and operating larger multifamily properties. And um, he wanted to sort of venture off on his own, start his own thing and have younger people like that he can mentor and, you know, do all the you know day to day operations. And um, he was a good mentor for us for many, many years. And then my dad helped like qualify for the loans in addition with Adrian and bring in the, all the original investors that were like clients of the firm or family friends and stuff. So uh, sort of buoyed, you know, I don't know what the word is, but I sort of went off his track record, my dad. And like I always recommend people. If you can't qualify for the loan, you, you bring someone in that can and you give them a piece of the deal. If you can't find the money, you bring in someone that can find the money, you give them a piece of the deal. Like you just got to plug holes and think creatively. And we gave up a lot of the economics in the early days to my dad and Adrian and the other gentlemen, like, because that's, we a, didn't have much experience and we didn't think, you know, it was warranted to get a huge amount of the thing, but yeah, the three young guys, we were only a third. So we were 11% each, but then over time, we, we became uh, 15% each. And then eventually Adrian went off and to partner with someone else. And then another, the young guy left. So it's now a real family business, me, my dad, and my cousin, a third, a third, a third. And, um, you know, it's uh, even my wife, you know, spearheads her own ground up development projects under a different name, but it's all, you know, all family. We all work together. Well, I was going to say that your real claim to fame is not growing guilt to a $2 billion asset under management. It's marrying Galena Skaya. That was the deal of the century. Um, yeah. 
So congratulations on inking that deal because uh, I know Galena and uh, that could not, that had to have been a harder sell than, uh, uh, than any of the other deals. And any investor, any project. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had a cold call for nine months to get a date even. So, and I definitely uh, got that one before, uh, you know, be, before the area developed. I, I got her very early in her uh, you know, career, I'd say. So yeah, we, we started with nothing. I started with this fourplex when I met her and it's pretty cool to have built this with her. And she um, was a very successful uh, tenant rep broker, but wasn't really happy and wasn't using her creative like juices and i told her like why don't we you know i'll support you and why don't you start she supported me in the beginning because she had an income i didn't have an income in the way beginning when we started i had like one fourplex and then so she um quit the job and started doing like some flipping on the side little homes and then started building some in single family homes and then building small apartment buildings and now she's building pretty much big apartment buildings so she spearheads all the ground up development projects for us and out of the box projects and very heavy value add projects. So she has her lane and it works because we're not like direct partners. I mean, she knows everything that's going on in my business and we support each other, but she, she gets to run her projects autonomously. And, and we, you know, Damien, me and my dad, we sort of run our own, but it's all inter interrelated. Well, let's just be honest. She's working while you're tweeting. Someone's got to do the hard work, man. Development. <laughs> is she, she is very much involved with her projects. I'm My role is now really capital raising. I have a, a team of 25 people in acquisitions and asset management and accounting. And she she uses that staff, but she's very hands-on with the all the entitlement process and, you know, underwriting her own deals. And she's she's not as great as, as at delegating as I am, I'd say. So, yeah. um, but she is ex exceptional at what she does. And um, her projects have been some of the best performing ones for sure. So um, if I, 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 I don't think this will be in, embarrassing. I think this will be part of the, uh, uh, the growth and the progression of Gelt. Well, first of all, tell everyone, what, how did you come up with the name Gelt and what does Gelt mean? Yeah, no, no embarrassing at all. My, my grandmother was a Holocaust survivor, spoke Yiddish in the house to my grandfather, who was a partisan in the war. And my father learned Yiddish. He didn't pass it on to me, unfortunately. And it's sort of a dying language. And I thought having a cool Yiddish word um, during Hanukkah time, it means money in Yiddish, but the Galt, when you think of Galt being Jewish, it's those little chocolate coins that you sort of play dreidel with and stuff and during Hanukkah. And it's sort of an endearing term. It's cute, it's funny, and it sort of differentiates us from all the other real estate companies that sort of sound the same to me. So Totally, I mean, from Black Rock and Blackstone and, and White Rock, and it's like, there's so many rocks. So many rocks, many stones, stones and and Yeah, it's like, you know, Gelt is like, and, and you know, I'd say half the people know what it means and half the do them don't, but it, the ones that don't, I explain it, and it's, it's, and it's easy to remember. It's four letters, you know. Well, what... That part I wasn't get, I wasn't alluding to may be embarrassing, but I do remember when I first met you, you were probably just starting out 25, 26 years old. Uh, and it was a Mariah Society, uh, American Jewish University uh, charity event at the Peninsula Hotel in Beverly Hills. And, you know, let, let's say 80, 90, 100 people were there. Most of them either in suits, we even wore ties back then. Now it's, you know, you're wearing a stylish T-shirt. Uh, I still have the, the collared shirt on. Um, but you guys, you and I'm assuming your cousin, um, wore like these green and white gelt maybe ties. Yeah. And, and and you had like gelt uh, uh, like pins and lapel pins and you were definitely decked out in, in Gelt. And I, I said, that is one confident fellow. <laughs> well, well, everyone looks the same in that room, right? They're yeah. all in suits like you alluded to. I'm younger. I'm obviously different. And um, yeah, I, I had the Gelt tie made that says Gelt on it. It's a great conversation starter. I mean, and then later you on. You still wear it. I did wear it, yeah. And then no, later do you, on. Do you still wear it? Still? Oh, do I still wear it? No, no. But I'll, I can wear it. I'll, I'll wear a green. Elena tie. has burned it. It did oh. not make it to the new house. No, it's, it's, I don't even know where it is. But like, yeah, I, have, I was looking through my office. I just moved. I had like Gelt watch made. This is Gelt on it. Like Gelt lapel pins, Gelt hats. It's part of our marketing and branding. You know, I, my license plate says Gelt Inc. on it. I don't know. It's just like, uh, you know, always uh, before it was in your face a little more. Now it's more subtle, I guess. But it's still, I want people to 
think of Gelt and be top of mind when they're thinking about allocating money with a real estate group, you know? Well, on a serious note, I mean, if, if you think of a lot of real estate owner, operator, syndicators, um, they don't brand their company. Maybe they'll use their name, but, but you at a young age took branding in a, in a serious way that a tech company, uh, I know to an extreme like Apple with their logos or any, IP, any tech company with their IP. And so it was, I mean, for me to notice you and, and, and I'm sure that's uh, many others uh, when you were meeting people for the first time, uh, whether it's the name, whether it's the look, whether it's the appearance, whether it's the youthfulness, whatever it is, you stood out. Yeah, no, look, um, my, my friend and mentor, Sam Freshman, he, he always likes giving out his business card, but he, when he gets people's business cards, he has two pockets, one for people he wants to follow up with and one that he'll just throw in there. And <laughs> he, he's like, you know, he saw something in me and, you know, like you said, the youthfulness, the energy, the probably a lot of himself from his earlier days. Like, you know, I reminded him and, um, you know, having good mentors and stuff is everything. We used to meet with them once a month, you know, to go over whatever we were dealing with. And eventually we did deals together and he's been a great partner and, has come to our rescue when you know some capital raises have been short. We we he's cl helped close them and we we help we keep raising and then kept you know funding the deal until we pay them off. And it, it just yeah he it's uh, it's good to have mentors and uh, you know people in your in your court. So what was the like, I like to say at least for my firm where we went from you know just a couple of lawyers in ten years ago to now forty lawyers another 10, 12 paralegals another ten or twelve staff and say it's a 60, 70 person operation and people all over the country and there was an oh shit moment like I've got a lot of people that are counting on me for uh, that uh, consistent paycheck for them to. Uh, you know, take care of their families and their children and uh, et cetera. And so when did that moment come to you uh, where you said, gosh, this is, this company has evolved to the point where um, we're now a big deal. This is a major operation, both internally from an employee perspective and externally from how the types of buildings you were buying, the types of investors you were attracting, the perception of the real estate market, not just locally within LA, but really regionally and I would say nationally. Yeah. Um, I'd say, um, yeah, from the beginning, we were, you know, aware these were family friends that were investing with us and not like uber, uber wealthy people, just people that had savings and like a lot of them relied on our quarterly cash flow to pay their living expenses. And, you know, so it's, I'm even more cautious with, people that invest with us than my own money. I'm with my own money. I'm, I'm a little more, I don't I mean, can you say reckless or loose? I mean, I'm, I'm but with this, I'm like, we can't ha ever have any permanent loss of capital. Uh, I take, I take way less risk and my, our goals are singles and doubles and long-term compounding, let, you know, utilizing all the real tax benefits in real estate. And that's what people like, you know, just the long-term nature of what we're think, how we think. And, you know, um, just that we're, very uber conservative, you know, 90 plus percent of our portfolios are like fixed rate debt, for example, we never, you know, maybe two years ago, we did a few bridge loans that, you know, are, are definitely affecting us, but not, not to the extent where, you know, it's, we're tremendously worried, like, you know, the whole company did bridge loans or whatever. So we're just super conservative. We raised extra money up front for rainy day reserves for deals. So we don't ever have to, we've never had a capital call ever. I mean, it's very unheard of to have never had a, a loss of a dollar and never have a capital call. And that's like my goal is just be consistent and steady throughout the years. So to the extent that you're willing to share about your strategy, I don't want to give state secrets, but not that there's really any in real estate, uh, hmm. it's basically an open book. Yeah. Um, and I know we've talked about this in the past, but you know, you, you seem to have uh, focused the equity capitalization on uh, purely syndications and just growing that uh, syndication pie as large as that pie can grow. Uh, others have um, grown through a different model, through I'd call more of an institutional joint venture model where a, uh, a capital group such as a Goldman Sachs or a, a AEW Aries will provide 90 to 95% 
of, of the capital. Uh, it's one-stop shopping, but you're working for that institution. Um, there's pros and cons to both, but you guys have focused on that syndication model of friends and family and beyond, uh, where you control the shots. So um, why haven't you deviated? Do you think you will uh, expand your capital base to include institutions? And so talk, talk through that, that decision. Yeah, I think uh, we, you know, it's a good question. We've always thought the grass is greener and looked at other business models. There's no right, right or wrong way, but there's definitely benefits that we like about syndication is um, one, we don't have to rely on any one capital partner, right? We have, you know, in the last deal, we had 200 people come into the deal. So it's like some people come in, some people don't, it, do it doesn't really matter. We're always gonna get these things capitalized. Um, two, we, we have the ability to hold long-term, which is how, in my opinion, you, you make the most money in real estate, just buy and hold. It's like the Buffett portfolio, buy, you know, great assets, at fair prices and good location and let you know time and inflation do its thing and you know with syndication we could sell and exchange you know these these institutional jvs they don't do that they have shorter term horizons they're more irr focused we're into like preservation of wealth growing safely and you know when we sell we could roll our promote like the investors do and have all those tax benefits and um and and in the funds there's like fund structure too you have to like sell everything within 10 years so you the benefit is you have all the capital committed and you can just call it and generally it's larger investors and but then you're left with nothing after 10 years you're always having to do another fund you always have to put out money we're selective in that we can pick and choose when and what we want to buy and it's um i think we're starting to talk to some groups about potentially doing like these institutional joint ventures just if something's too big for us to go after maybe um or if we have another deal going on and there's something else, like it's hard for us to simultaneously raise for two different deals um, or buy a large portfolio, I'd say. So we, we do have our limits right now um, with the syndication model. Um, but, but, you, uh, but you say limits, but yet it, I feel like- It gets bigger and bigger. I mean, our last raise was $39 million of equity. I mean, for generally- so you said Yeah, generally syndicates are like, one to 10 million, like, you know, for, from passing the hat kind of thing to individuals, but we have a pretty broad network and yeah. So 200 investors, 39 million. So that's like average of 200,000 per investor. And, you know, some put as little as a hundred thousand and some put as much as I think 5 million. So it's, it's skewed up. But the, and how long does it take you? How long did it take you to raise a 39 million? Um, it took the whole time. We were just kept raising, raising the last like five, 10% is always the struggle. It's, it seems like no matter what the size of the deal, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not going to lie, like some deals, you, you know, they're, if they're really small, they'll oversubscribe in a day or two kind of thing after the email. But generally, we don't even send that out to everyone because they're, they're just too small. And that's why it like it takes the same amount of time and energy to buy a big deal as a small deal. And I, I'd rather try to get more of the investors in than have to pick and choose who's going to come into a deal or not, you know, make everyone angry kind of thing. So um, we keep pushing the envelope, trying to buy bigger and bigger deals. And, um, you know, obviously price per unit has gone up. So it's a combination of um, us looking at bigger deals and also the, the market, you know, and, and the, the debt, you can't get as much leverage, right? We're at, we were at 55% leverage only. So this wasn't nearly the biggest deal in terms of, um, uh, like purchase price, but an equity raise, it was one of the biggest ones. Yeah. yeah. Well, I would say, uh, before COVID certainly in the mid to late, I guess, teens, uh, um, the rule of thumb for my clients is if you were raising, you know, one to five million, you were doing syndications. If you were raised, if it, if it was a deal that required over 15 million of equity, you were going through an institution. And if it was five to 15 million, that was the tweener space. That was the hardest space to, to solve for, where it was family offices, maybe someone had a bigger syndication network, they could get their institutions didn't want to do anything under 15. So there was a lot of um, opportunity in, the, in in that space. Fast forward just a couple of years. Now um, institutions don't won't, won't touch deals unless if it's 30, 40 million of equity. Syndicators like yourself and MG Properties and others, there you guys are able. You just uh, su successfully raised 40 million dollars. I mean, it really is a a testament both to Gelt and just how the the real estate market has. I don't know if it's mature is the right word, but it has evolved in in a way over the last few years where um, 
I feel like for institutions, the only way they're going to be able to survive is to do these giant deals. But how many giant deals are there? So um, I, I feel like the syndication model, although it takes a lot of work in the back office and, and talk about the, the number of employees and staff that you have in order to effectively onboard investors, give them reporting, uh, answer their questions, you know, issue the K-1s. I mean, that's that's a major operation that some real estate owner operators, they don't want to deal with. Yeah, look, I mean, I think we use technology as much as we can. You know, we're, uh, you know, I think we use IMS to help us with, with that, but, um, Definitely, that's our biggest department is accounting and investor relations. Um, you know, we have a great staff that these within 24 hours is my goal always to get back to these investors, right? And um, that's like you can't. I don't think you just call up the CEO of like Equity Residential or Avalon Bay or whatever. Like you, can, I, I, I'm available anytime, all the time, kind of thing to answer any questions. If I don't, if I don't have the answer, I'm going to get them the answer. Um, and generally, I like to onboard the people myself. Sometimes. Um, different team member does if it came in through them. Um, but I like to tell them about all the risks involved, get, get make sure they really understand what they're getting into and um, onboard them myself. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's uh, really, it takes years to really get it to snowball, but like anything that compounds, it starts getting easier and goes quicker as you build a track record and you get a reputation and it's hopefully a good reputation, you know, like Geld has get reputation go, go the other way too pretty quickly. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty wild to see, um, how, how quickly the last, like the first five years compared to the, the next five years compared to the, I guess we're 13 years, the next three years, it's, it's gone like that. It, it really has. It, it, it was so hard for us to raise, uh, when we jumped, made the jump from the $1.3 million raise for that $3.9 million Bakersfield deal to the, we bought a deal in Phoenix for 16 million. We needed to raise five, five and a half million. It took us six months to raise that in 2010. Yeah. And thank God we did. I mean, the thing is now worth like, I mean, we sold it, but it's, it's probably worth a hundred million today. We sold it for like 30 million. We thought we were geniuses, but um, yeah, it, 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 we just like kept pushing the envelope to keep up to buy bigger and bigger. And, you know, it, I've always been like, I sort of like putting myself in those uncomfortable situations. It doesn't feel great, but it's like, I push myself every time to, and we have some backstops like, like the San freshman gentleman, or we have, our own now lines of credit and our own cash to backstop if, if we're ever short. So we've never not done a deal because of equity. We've not done a deal. If there's major findings. Like we had a major repipe that we didn't know about. We, we, we had to do. And so we just, you know, we retraded for that and, and the deal just didn't transact or major retaining wall, you know, multi-million dollar project. But yeah, we've never not been able to raise capital to buy a deal. Um, so I know we, for, we at the beginning of, of our talk, uh, we briefly touched upon today's market, and it's completely different today mm -hmm. than I would say four or five months ago. Um, mm -hmm. So, how are you positioning the company? Uh, I've got some clients that are completely on the sidelines, waiting for there to be blood on the streets, waiting for distress, waiting for for owners to have issues with you know floating rate debt or when their debt matures most likely in 2023 or even 24 then they'll re-enter the market um uh what what is your guys's philosophy as we sit here going into the final three months of of the year and, and even for the next let's say 12 months yeah i mean so i'd say we're always cautiously optimistic we were buying but we were buying in you know into more core areas as the market over the years you know kept going up essentially and selling off the, the older buildings that are tougher to hold long term because of all the capital needs um we uh you know just closed that one in studio city so we're not on the sidelines completely like we did pause during covid for a little bit to see how things happen with the in terms of collections and operations in the current portfolio um we did pause a little bit after the studio city deal was awarded we did pause a little bit on new acquisitions to see how things would shake out um but we're, we're still looking and actively making offers but yeah values are down 10 to 25 percent approximately depending on the the market and the age of the building um and you know like my sam freshman always says like 
you don't know what the building, the value is going to be in the next one, two, three years, but in the next five to 10 years, the rents are going to be higher. The, the value is going to be higher. That's why we, we always, you know, project long-term holds. And so we can weather any downturns, right? You never want to be a forced seller, sell at the wrong time and, or be forced to sell. Like, and um, I think across the portfolio, we have very low leverage. Um, we are ins pretty insulated. We, and when we started in 09, we had no properties to worry about. So that was awesome, right? Like that's why for real estate, it's great to start during a downturn because you have no legacy issues. Right. So in terms of rents are still growing, but they're decelerating. So are we going to see negative rent growth, like rents dropping? And I mean, maybe like these, you see like in Phoenix now, occupancy is at like a 10 year low and you have a, new, a huge amount of new supply coming online. And, you know, with the, the just the economy slowing down, these it, it could be a recipe for, for disaster, but at the same time, I mean, it's just weird because the the, the, the the job market's pretty strong still. Like you have, you know, wage growth, um, which is good for rent growth. But you, you've had bonkers rent growth like we've never seen before. 20, 30 percent year over year, like unsustainable well, stuff. What goes up quick usually comes down fast in, in, in life in general. So I'm like, this is not sustainable. Like, you know, don't un just underwrite his average historical averages for rent growth. Three percent a year. Like it's this is just insane. You know, it's it's. Just wacky times, you know, 30%. Well, clients, yeah, clients of mine, I would say two months ago, weren't concerned about rising interest rates because they said rent growth would far outpace the rise of interest rates. But is that still the case? No, no. I mean, aren't you concerned of how interest rates are now higher than cap rates? Um, how yeah, negative and, leverage is, is, is no joke. And, um, yeah. you know, we... Uh, We've always had positive leverage up until like the last year. The Studio City deal, we bought it like a three eight cap, but we we were going to bring it to like a five and a quarter, five and a half cap after all the renovations over time and stuff. And so, but this is like a core asset. We we bought it with very low leverage. So where the people are going to get in trouble is if they were buying with eighty to ninety percent, you know, bridge debt, and those bridge loans ha have gone up tremendously with the interest rates. And um, yeah, eventually, if, if the values don't go back up tremendously, you'll have to do cash in to refi, like put more money in to make that loan because the value will be down so much. Like when when we started buying in Phoenix in 2010, we we saw all these buildings that went were for, foreclosed on that just the loans came due at the wrong time and the values were way down and they had us either sell at a loss of principal or put up a lot more money to make the shortfall between the, you know, the, the new mortgage and the old mortgage. So um, and, and I guess operationally they suffered because rents dropped like 20%. So a lot of people couldn't make the mortgage payment for an extended period of time. So I'm already hearing actually, uh, um, I'm not going to go into names, but groups that are, uh, not defaulting, but not, are they missing mortgage payments already because, because of rapid rising rates. Um, I'm, I'm hearing all kinds of crazy stories going on that cracks are beginning to show. And, um, yeah, it's, I, I, I think this time is, is going to it's going to be different kind of recession and different kind of stuff going on in the real estate market, but the interest rates rising this quickly, we were borrowing in the 2% range. Now it's like in the 5% range. It, it, it's a pretty big drastic change, right? And the single family housing is going to change too, right? I mean, it's, it's uh, mortgage payments have doubled for people. Do you think you will have um, any more acquisitions before the end of the year? I hope so. I'm, I'm always in acquisition mode, but it's, it's gotta be, risk adjusted returns, right? Like we're, but do you we're, think sellers, do you think sellers have gotten that message? I mean, it just feels like maybe a lack of a lack of transactions because sellers don't have to sell. They saw what their real estate was worth just six months ago. And maybe they're just they're wanting to uh it's cash flowing, right? They had fixed debt, they're cash if, flowing. If they've owned it a long time and it's yeah, if they've owned it a long time and it's fixed rate debt and cash flowing and they have a long term horizon, sure, then they're, they're not need to sell they don't want to sell but like um there might be some more forced sellers out there in the market pr pretty soon i think and you know we like we're, we're we're in the process of selling a building and like yeah it was worth a lot more before but we're going to exchange and the thing we're buying is now worth a lot less too so it's like we're going to make it back on the buy um kind of thing so I, I, you can't anchor to the old prices i mean they're not there right now and could they be there short in the next year or two or three or uh, who knows? It might take a while to hit those kind of values again if cap rates rise tremendously. So that's why I'm always like long term. You know, the the time fixes all with 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 real estate. You know, being being safe and let the time do its thing.
so in 2021 and certainly in the beginning of 2022, there was a like a backlash against Southern California and that a lot of our clients were investing everywhere else, Vegas, Phoenix, Salt Lake, Dallas, Austin, Florida, Carolinas. Yeah. You, you just came in strong with a, uh, an acquisition in Studio City at the beginning of our conversation. Yeah, when your clients were going to those areas and bidding cap rates to three or sub three, we were buying in Long Beach, Long Beach, mm -hmm. Anaheim, Southern Studio City, all Southern mm -hmm. California core infill 2010 and newer generally buildings and yeah we we're buying them at much higher cap rates and in areas i think that will in the long run do much better because of high barriers to entry and because these buildings are are, are newer as well so i so think all that is priced in. i think the california risk was priced in and um i think uh just if it wasn't priced in then yeah i'd say maybe those other markets are better but it just didn't make sense to me these valuations versus those other markets and um in the, in the long run I, I thought it was going to revert back to the mean you know so it sounds like these buildings are not governed by rent control but are you concerned about just the governmental the political climate of california yeah it's definitely uh you know rules can change and they do change it's like a pendulum that swings back and forth i think it gets very extreme one way and then it goes back the other way and yeah, none of the we only bought one building in Brent, Brentwood here that was uh, subject to LA rent control. Everything else in the portfolio is not. The Studio Cities, because of its age, is not subject to LA rent control. Uh, no rent control like Long Beach, Anaheim. We have the, the state rent caps and stuff, but um, definitely we plan for the worst. I mean, we're, that's why we won't we won't really buy a rent control building where the rents are tremendously below market if it's a sizable building and um, you know it, it's it's just. Unless we, unless the price was very, very good, where it made sense in place, it had decent cash flow, and generally that's not the case. But you know, it's it's all risk adjusted returns. I think there is the risk, but if it's priced in, then 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 it's okay. So uh, I want to be respectful of your time because I know you have to continue tweeting uh, after this uh, conversation. But on a, I do want to ask about social media and your mm -hmm. use of Twitter and and. Um, there's this whole real estate Twitter community and even conferences that are centered around the real estate Twitter community. Um, I guess I'll just ask you sort of bluntly, why are you so active on Twitter? Does it help you in your business? Is it more of just like a social outlet or is it, is there a business component? Um, you know, tell me, tell me more about, you know, the benefits of, of your, of your use of, of Twitter and other social media. I know I, it almost sound like I'm a, like I'm an 80 year old grandpa. Like what is this social media? But I, I, I say it no, more a, for any professional, it's important. It, it depends yeah. on what kind of business you're in. So I'd say mm -hmm. I use the different platforms for different reasons. So LinkedIn, I, I don't enjoy as much. I do use it to connect with people all the time, like get warm intros to people. Um, I do post stuff sporadically on LinkedIn to update people. And I want to stay top of mind for brokers, sellers, and investors that are all on LinkedIn. Most people are on LinkedIn, right? So I use that as a tool. I use Twitter as an outlet. A, I enjoy it and I have fun and I'm always joking around and I just enjoy the, the, the actual platform. I spend the most time on that one of all the social medias, but it's good for like following, following like-minded people, meeting people all around the country and world that are like-minded and um, being able to talk about what's on your mind at any given time and have a following that you could publicly respond or privately respond. And we've developed tremendous relationships with um, mainly investors, other owners too, people I've invested in their companies like side little angel checks and stuff, people that have run like we, we did that VC stuff for a while. I, all these people, so many relationships are now started on Twitter and I, and then they go into real life and I, it sort of all blends together. Right. So I think it just opens the funnel to more people that are interested in what I have to say and what I have to do. And, um, you know, like case examples, we had a recent, um, investor sold farmland from Iowa, Des Moines, Iowa, and I never would have connected with these people if uh for for not twitter but i've never even been to des moines iowa i don't i don't I, it's not a circle of my competence my circles are you know the jewish community in la my ypo real you know family like you, you got me into ypo or my tiger 21 investing people or where my kids school like i have the country club i have circles of influence but now the world is your circle so like yeah i think it's a good tool for 
attracting talent. I go, I get people all the time that are looking to work for us. So I get to cherry pick who, if I'm interested in following with that, following up with someone like that. Obviously, the, the people that are interested in investing, other other owners that see that we're active in the market. Uh, I think social media is great for being top of mind. Instagram, I used to have it public. I made it private just because I have family, like, like kids and pictures. And so everyone that knows me, like uh, personally, I know them. They know me. Like I let them follow um, on Instagram, Facebook. Also, I made private. Uh, don't really post there. I just let the Instagram roll to Facebook. Um, what other social medias? No, no snapping, no Snapchat. That's, that's for the youngins. Um, TikTok. No TikTok. I mean, that's, but literally people are searching on TikTok now for things like that's the young generation. So I think for products and services that are geared to the young people, I think companies need to utilize those plans. I invested in a company called Psychedelic Water that sells like this bottle of water that's really cool looking. And it's like, it's all over TikTok and stuff. It's, it's that generation. Um, and you have the uh, the Mr. Be Mr. Beasts of the world and influencers and companies that are started by influencers like, you know, the, uh, I mean, you, everyone talks about like the Kardashians be being the poster children of that, but then you have a ton of other ones that, that are equally successful or are doing very well. So it's just a new world and social media is just a, a good tool to uh, stay top of mind in my opinion. Yeah. No, look, it, it, it absolutely is. And it, and it, it, it wouldn't be this prevailing and prevalent in our lives if it didn't work. Uh, if yeah. it were just merely social and, and, and you couldn't get more out of it, then. Uh, it's, it's the best way to get news, unfiltered news. Like I used to, I haven't watched news. I, I like reading the Wall Street Journal because I could on my own time look at what I'm interested in, read if I'm more interested. Twitter, same thing. I get it. You could follow reporters, follow people on the ground, follow whatever you're interested in those topics. You could follow people that have those kind of interests or that could report on that kind of stuff. And I think it's like, instead of just watching the tube and seeing, I haven't watched TV in years. It's like, you, you have to sit there and watch what they're talking about. And most of it, I'm not even interested in. So it's like, you could really curate your, your, what you're interested in, in, in your life uh, via following Twitter. It takes, it's a big time investment, but I think, and it's a little, it's slightly addictive for sure. I'm not going to lie, but it's uh, I think it's been a good investment. Yeah. Um, so I've been told that, um, of all my podcasts, the last uh, two minutes of my lightning round is the most exciting and most fun, given that this is my first podcast and episode. Um, we'll see if that's the case. So let's do a, a, a few last questions, lightning round, quick, an quick answers to these questions. Um, and then you can be the judge uh, if that was uh, the best part of our, uh, of our discussion. Let's do so, it. So Keith, if you weren't in real estate, what would you be doing right now? I'd be running some other entrepreneurial venture um, and uh, growing it. I, I'm, I'm a born entrepreneur. I, I can't have a job. I, I, I joke that I, I couldn't even spell job. So, yeah. <laughs> um, what's the best advice someone gave you? Uh, what's the best advice of what? The best advice someone has given you. Because it sounds like you've got, you've had a lot of mentors. Yeah. On real estate advice, I'd say time and inflation are real estate's best friends. The same mentor, his name was Jonah Goldrich. He said he'd rather regret not buying a property than buying a property that he would later regret. So I, I really enjoyed that one too. Yeah, would, um, I, was, I guess the next question maybe it's similar is what advice would you have given yourself at 25 or 24 years old of what you know now? Um, uh, if you could say, Hey, Keith, watch out for blank. I'd say watch out for, um, going into business with people that aren't aligned like investors or partners, you got to be aligned and have the same, you know, morals, ethics, and, and just like, uh, you know, thought process and trust and, and, um, be on the same wavelength. Also, I wish uh, I was buying real estate even earlier, you know, maybe, uh, at 17, even, you know, could, could always be earlier buying real estate. So well, you better get your kids on this uh, train. Yeah. Uh, and I know you do, uh, what, is there one deal that you remember not doing that you regret that you didn't, that you passed on? And then you saw, I don't know how, how well it did and maybe it traded. And I mean, in reality, everything we've sold has gone up tremendously in value. So another, you know, mentor says you sell, you lose. And it's sort of true. I mean, we sold in Phoenix in 2017, almost everything before the huge run up and, you know, the buildings we bought for the bought that building we bought for 16 million in 2010 we sold for like 27 million in 2016 maybe or, and we thought we were geniuses 
probably worth, well, it was probably worth 100. Maybe it's now worth 75, 80. But where you could get in trouble is it, maybe if, if, if it's worth that much and then you pull out a ton of money and lever up again, you, you, you still could get into big tr trouble and, and then use that money to buy more stuff. So it's like, you know, things happen for a reason. Those, those early wins help propel us by giving us a track record. We return capital to investors. It's hard. I, I'm the worst at it. I always send my partners like when these deals retrade and retrade and they're always going to retrade at higher numbers and unless they are for sellers and this might be happening and sell, they sell at a lower price than what they previously sold that. But, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, these prices are going to look freaking cheap. I bet um, when, when rents keep going up, up, up over time, they'll have some dips, you know, just like values, but over a long period of time, um, you, you can't go wrong buying in growing areas and stuff. And last question, what, uh, what do you hope to be doing 10 years from now? Um, but doing the exact same thing and just putting more of my own money in my own deals um, and getting my kids uh, involved in the business. Yeah. I love it. Well, Keith, you've been so generous with your time. Uh, I really appreciate you being on our maiden voyage, our inaugural episode of Real Talk. Thank you and um, best of luck uh, with everything, both uh, uh, from real estate perspective, family perspective, and uh, just everything. Uh, I thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. We're going to crack the top 50 uh, podcasts uh, nationwide. I, I have a good feeling here. I love it. I appreciate it. All right. Well, that's it for the first episode of Real Talk. Hope you enjoyed it. You've been listening to Real Talk, real estate discussions with Andrew Kirsch. You can catch prior episodes at www.sklarkirsch.com and on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts and more. Thank you for your positive reviews, comments and sharing this show with others.